morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Tara Karen. I'm a family doctor at St. Michael's Hospital and a Vice Chair of Quality and Innovation at the University of Toronto Department of Family and Community Medicine. I'm delighted to welcome you to our third community of practice for family doctors um, around how we can support each other um, during this um, uncertain time. Um, this uh, series of, um, of a community of practice sessions is co-hosted by the Department of Family Medicine at U of T and the Ontario College of Family Physician. And uh, to that effect, I want to just to pass on the baton to uh, Jennifer Young, the president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians, uh, to just say a few words. Um, it's a real privilege to join this third session uh, that will that is concentrating on changing the way we work and hearing from our own colleagues about the amazing and adaptable work that is that's going on around the province. Um, it will it is meant to share and inspire and assist you hearing hearing these stories. Um, each of you will will take what you've heard and and hopefully adapt some parts of it to challenges that you're facing in your practices now, and in your communities. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing from three of our wonderful colleagues who, um, who will be speaking to ways that they and their communities are supporting patients with increased mental distress. Um, it's really my privilege to share this uh, with, with, uh, with Tara that, and, uh, and uh, thanks to the Department of Family and Community Medicine, the OCFP, AFTO for their, for their um, uh, involvement in this. Um, I, uh, it is a one credit per hour learning program that's been certified by the by the college um, for up to one main pro uh, credit. Um, the the um, so that that would be what I would say right now, Tara. That I'd like to give a land acknowledgement if that's uh, if that's okay with you. Um, we we do acknowledge that the land on which we are hosting uh, this meeting is the traditional territory of of many nations. We acknowledge that Ontario is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and that each of you are joining us from one of those many traditional and treaty territories. We are grateful to be able to come together in this way. Um, so I think the land acknowledgement is often a great time for us to uh, reflect on the injustices that uh, Indigenous people in Canada have had to face over the years. That includes the injustices of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And I think that um, that issue has been highlighted even more recently um, because of COVID. We know that uh, unfortunately COVID has meant a rise in domestic violence and specifically um, domestic violence among Indigenous women. Next slide, Brian. Um, I wanted to also, though, reflect on actions that we can take to support women. Um, the three um, lot, uh, resources at the bottom are examples of resources that you can um, refer any woman to who's uh, you worried about domestic violence, who's experiencing domestic violence. The top resources is specific to Indigenous women. It's a resource called Talk for Healing, um, and it's a culturally safe telephone helpline that does provide actually translated help as well. Um, next slide. So, you know, I think the other thing that we can do is um, also indicate to women how it is that they can signal for help and uh, ensure that as providers, we're com comfortable with this signal um, so that if we are on a video call with a woman, we can see it. Actually, prior to this session, we did get a number of questions from um, you, the audience, and a couple of the questions did relate to um, supporting women who are experiencing domestic violence. And uh, I think they were really reflecting on the fact that as we transition to virtual care, it sometimes really uh, poses a lot of challenge. So how do you assess by, uh, a, a, um, potential abuse while you're on a virtual call? How do you deal with an, someone who has an abuser in the home when you're on the phone? And I think the other thing that I, I will reflect back um, after speaking to a couple of colleagues around your questions is that you know this, this may be a situation where we want to actually bring people into the clinic. Um, so Today, I, I want to welcome you to our third session um, and uh, just highlight that uh, when we put this session together, it was really um, designed as a way to learn from each other 
Um, we know that we don't have all the answers, but together, hopefully we can find them, um, showcase each other with some best practices and uh, help to um, uh, also uh, share resources that are out there in the community. Next slide. Um, I think I'm just putting up there um, some of our disclosures, but in particular, I want to uh, thank our planning committee, Trish O'Brien, uh, Leanne Clark, Susan Taylor, and Mina Viscardi Johnson. Um, they've done a fantastic job behind the scenes, and I also wanted to thank um, Marissa uh, uh, Schwartz, uh, Leanne Butler, and Brian De Silva, who's controlling the slides behind. Next slide. Um, our past sessions you can view um, on our webpage. Uh, so just check it out at uh, dfcm.utoronto.ca, COVID-19 Community of Practice. We've um, posted the, the actual webinars themselves, but also lots of resources. And I noticed when we got questions today, there were some questions about resources that um, I think we probably have answered also in other previous webinars. So do check out those links. Um, today, I'd like to welcome our three panelists who are going to be joining us from um, across Ontario. So we have uh, Dr. Leah Scori, who's a panelist from the Barry Community Health Center, Dr. Claudette Chase, who is um, a family doctor in uh, the primary health care unit in Sioux Lookout, and Dr. Javed Alu from the Nymark Medical Center at CAMH uh, here in Toronto. We're also lucky to be joined by two other panelists uh, who um, are, are guests on every community of practice because of the wisdom that they bring and the knowledge that they bear. Dr. Jennifer Young, the OCFP president who you met, and Dr. David Kaplan, um, who's um, the uh, clinical chief at Ontario Health Quality and uh, uh, also a family doctor at North York University. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to in turn introduce themselves and uh, speak to their disclosure. Leah, can you go first? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, sit in on this webinar. My name is Leah Scori. I'm a family physician at the Berry Community Health Center. Um, I provide comprehensive care and have a a bit more of an interest in mental health issues and supporting vulnerable populations. Um, as you can see, in terms of my disclosures, I do receive um, some honoraria from the Ontario College of Family Physicians related to um, some work that I've done uh, with the mentoring networks. I also do some consulting with the Center for Effective Practice, as well as Project ECHO in uh, children and youth mental health. Claudette? Okay, Claudette, who is rather stressed this morning, um, I have had some technical difficulties connecting and um, do, trying to do it all on half a cup of coffee, but I am a comprehensive family doctor who does most of her work these days in a remote First Nation called Yabmatung or Fort Hope, um, and then still some hospital work, but less and less as I get older and older. And some phone backup. Check. And Check. I, in terms of disclosures, I have had honorariums from the OCFP, but that's it. Javed? Um, so I'm Javed Alou, I'm a family doctor here in Toronto. And aside from my comprehensive family practice, which actually has a concentration on chronic disease like diabetes and a lot of mental health care, and also do teaching and work with CAMH on the Echo Mental Health Network, the series of programs, which I'll reference a bit. Um, and that's some of the CHR grants that we have and virtual research from that. Um, and um, the uh, other advisory boards are with the various diabetes companies that I've worked with over the last two years. Um, I'm gonna turn it, I'm gonna uh, declare my own disclosures at this time. I'm a family doctor, but also a researcher. So I have a number of uh, grants and also salary support that I am listing there. Um, uh, the only one that's from a for-profit company is from Gilead Sciences Incorporated uh, for a grant to cure hepatitis C. David? Sure. Hi, I'm David Kaplan. I'm a family doctor at North York. Um, so disclosure-wise, uh, to receive an honoraria from the Ontario College, uh, and I'm a salary employee of Ontario Health, which is an arm's length agency of the government of Ontario. Jennifer? Uh, I'm, uh, I have no relationship with financial sponsors, but do receive honoraria from the Ontario College of Family Physicians. 
And so, of course, then there's you guys, our participants, and you're coming from all across Ontario today, uh, lots from the GTA, but also, um, you know, we've got Lindsay, Wasaga Beach, Canada, um, Cornwall, uh, Sioux Lookout, of course. So um, people from all over Ontario, which is lovely to see. Um, next slide. So you guys are really a big part of um, what we uh, what we are going to get out of today. Um, the panelists are going to share resources, but I know you will be too. So I just want to go over how that works. Um, you can type in your questions in the Q and A box, and um, our panelists will do our best to answer them. Some we might answer in writing, some we might answer live. I will be prioritizing questions that are in the Q&A um, over questions that we've gotten pre-session. Um, um, so if you don't hear a, sesh, a question that you asked pre-session and you really want it answered, please put it into the Q&A. Uh, and if you just want to connect with others or if you have an answer or resource you want to share, um, please do feel free to use the chat to connect with others. So I'm delighted to start our um, panel discussion uh, today. And uh, Claudette, how are you feeling about going first? Are you are you settled in there, or do you want a, a break? Well, I don't I don't know if it's good news or bad news that I can't see myself because I ended up only being able to connect <laughs> on the iPad and not my computer that I'm a little more Ooh. comfortable with. But um, maybe if I just launch into it, I'll so let me yeah. present. <laughs> well, Claudette, I'm I mean I think we can all see you. Um, which is wonderful. And I know, you know, you have a very particular vantage point um, working in the north um, with Indigenous communities. So I think we'd love to hear more about, you know, the mental health um, challenges that you've observed and how you've supported um, your colleagues and your community. Well, I, when we did our practice session, I realized I was using it more for a personal therapy session because as many of you, I'm sure, there is a tremendous underlying anxiety as we worry about ourselves and our family and our friends and our patients and their families. And from the beginning, um, there has been tremendous concern in the communities. As many of you know, elders are treasured, uh, often have connections to people that are stronger than um, I have, I've experienced it in my own family, which I consider quite close. And those, so the fear when they heard that people who were older and people who had multiple illnesses, which pretty much describes anybody over 50 in the community I serve, where it is the unusual person that doesn't have type two diabetes, hypertension, and some degree of renal failure, the community I serve also has a pretty high incidence of, an, of um, autoimmune disease. We see a lot of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, so, and, and it starts young. So um, obviously it was a community at risk and they understood they were at risk. But the inspiring part of this has been being able to work with organizations that serve the community. So, um, for the broad geographic area of the north, which in a map we take up a huge percentage of Ontario, even though we're not a huge percentage of the population, Nan Nishinabiaski Nation is the political organization, and they developed an emergency COVID response team, and there is a subgroup. I'm on the bigger group as well as the subgroup for mental health and addictions with many, many other healthcare professionals. So that's one of the broad things that happened. There was an organizational response to the concerns. The particular concerns we've heard have been around the young, that because as you all of you know, I'm sure, we have a very high suicide rate in some of our First Nations, not all of them, but some of them. And, um, and then with the elderly already carrying the burden of illness they do to add to this. And the piece that the community is only now starting to ask questions about because they've heard rumors that we aren't going to do resuscitations, that all old people are going to be considered DNR. And, you know, we're trying to counter this in the environment where the nursing stations were not allowed to run full codes because we would put nurses at risk by doing 
a normal resuscitation. Equipment has been ordered supposedly to make this a safer procedure, but it's not there yet. So trying to meet with leadership and explain that they really need to talk to the old and the sick because if they did get COVID and they did get sent out, odds are if they got on a ventilator, they wouldn't be coming home. And those are the types of conversations we're trying to have with people now. And I must say I leak tears on pretty much a daily basis with this. So I, I can turn any session into a Claudette therapy session. So, um, but in terms of the, the resources, so started with NAN, and then Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority, which we refer to as SLIFNA, and based in Sioux Lookout provides program support. And they have a large mental health segment called NODEN. They have community wellness teams. We have tried to pull together, we looked where there were gaps on the committee. And we realized that for teenagers who like texting and technology a lot better than they like the phone and and face to face which is no longer available in most communities though some communities have identified their wellness teams as essential workers who have to come in so there is still some face to face but for the most part it's disappeared so people who had several years relationship with a counselor now can only talk to them on the phone. Um, there's wonderful ability through, supposedly through OTN and um, doxy.me, which if any of you have tried, it's a really simple and protected way to do video. But we don't have fiber optic cable into Fort Hope and the internet there is pathetic. Um, years ago, OTN did a big splash launch of giving us a second um, telehealth machine but unfortunately we don't have the connectivity to run to at the same time. <laughs> so um, it's good to have backups though when, when the other one dies. So the video conferencing, which has been shown in studies to be quite effective in remote First Nations in our area, and in fact, often more effective with young people than the face-to-face is not really feasible in many of our communities, although increasingly there is fiber optics. So we're trying to support at the community level. And the story I told the other day, I think is, I'll, I'll try to tell it quickly and then pass on to my other panelists. Um, there was a death of a mental health worker in her 50s who had the chronic illnesses I explained was on peritoneal dialysis, still came to work every day, um, a lovely, lovely person. And the funeral was held. We, you know, from a distance, you know, I do a call every morning with the community. We tried to plan for the funeral. And it was, I had been on the committee that had come up with a document. It was all very abstract. We'd had the elders write a letter to support the document. We had an elder on our weekly radio show that myself and a doctor whose mother is from the community do to talk about this. And then a real funeral happened. And the mistake we made was in not debriefing immediately. And when we did five days later, with the people who had actually, the community members who had run the funeral, the unbelievable trauma for these natural helpers of not being able to hug people they saw crying, not being able to um, comfort themselves and others in the ways that have been worked out over the years was extremely difficult. And I think it brought to the forefront uh, the worries, the anxiety, the panic. So we are trying to garner as many telephone resources as we can. There's a physician in the community right now, and we will continue to offer radio support and phone counseling and contact as much as we can. I did link to the NAN resources, including the funeral and bereavement documents, which I think are helpful. And we're going to update on the basis of this funeral to include debriefing and perhaps considering outside people to come in. So 
like our local workers, they can't get the thought out of their heads of putting the tape down on the church floor for how far apart people had to stand. Um, so we have more resources at this time. And believe it or not, it's almost overwhelming at times because you, there's little bits of money going little bits of places. And so if you stay on top of it, there are resources, but there's not like a single door entry into the service. So you almost have to be a detective to be a good family doctor in this, as in many other things. Um, I'll stop there so that there's plenty of time for the others and for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudette, for sharing that, you know, really personal story, a story personal to you and your community. Um, and I think you've touched on some of the really unique challenges in the North, um, given the geography and, you know, that, that you can't rely on video is, you know, un unfortunate. Um, but it's amazing the work you've done to um, support community creatively, for example, through a radio program. Um, I have shared um, the uh, resources you sent just now in the chat, um, so people can uh, click on those links and we'll also have a slide later that we can display to that effect. Um, if you have any questions for Claudette, um, please just put them into the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I think one that Brent, um, my colleague in Barry, um, put out right now is, you know, can we develop new ways of supporting one another in times of grief? What is the version of a virtual hug? Um, Jennifer, did you want to speak to that? There is no version of a virtual hug. There is honestly nothing. There's something chemical that happens when you hug somebody when you're in grief and it just cannot be replaced. I think it's just something we, I, I don't know the way around it. Did anyone of our other panelists wanted to chime in there? I think uh, it's Javed. Um, so I think, um, I think Jennifer's right. Like it's not gonna be the same thing and that's very true. Um, and there's many different things a hug does for us. There certainly is that oxytocin release, that, that bonding support, the knowing we're actually physically holding each other up, not just emotionally or psychologically holding each other up, that actually is meaningful. Um, but I think at least expressing that and recognizing we're actually both sad together that we actually are not alone in the process is something that we can actually begin to do. And I think conversations like the one we had today with Claudette actually sharing and we're all witnessing being together and understanding and seeing the parallels in our own experience. Two parts of this is a way that we are actually holding each other up right now. Um, even if we're not able to physically do it, we're doing it in the other ways that we can. And I think that's a start. It helps in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so in, I think, Claudette, you've given us a unique perspective from the North, and, and we'll certainly have time to ask uh, more questions of you, but I think at this time what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Leah. Um, so you work in a very different community in Barrie, um, and I know you have a, a large mental health and addictions practice, and you were also talking to us about um, your work um, supporting people who are homeless who are living in an isolation shelter uh, during this time. Um, how, you know, what are some of the um, reflections you've had on mental health and addictions during this time and, and what uh, have, has helped you to pull through and what advice do you have for colleagues um, on the line? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks for that. I, uh, so in our community, um, when we looked at what, what, what can we offer, it was maybe reaching out to the vulnerable population. And so uh, many of the homeless people have been moved into a hotel. So we've pulled together to try and provide um, primary care support to the shelters. And so with that, um, I had an opportunity to provide um, an outreach clinic. So I was dressed in full PPE. And what I was struck with is, you know, I, I rely so much on, on developing that therapeutic alliance and sort of holding this compassionate space. And it was really tricky where um, the, the resident I was seeing had a mask on, I'm in a mask with a shield. Um, and it was, it was really hard to sort of form um, that, that bond. It was a very different interaction. Um, and I think as we, as we move through this, um, it's, I've become aware that I probably have to learn how to be more engaged in a virtual way. Um, <clears throat> I find I'm, you know, relying on the telephone because I'm more comfortable than trying to uh, deal with the technical issues of virtual care right now. Um, but again, that just creates a bit of a barrier. 
Um, I think, you know, listening to Claudette and, um, and Jennifer and just the struggles uh, with the amount of stress that everyone is feeling and how we sort of mitigate turn that becoming distress um, is, is looking at ways to maybe comfort ourselves. So this would draw on um, aspects of mindfulness, self-compassion. And I think, you know, Brent, if we can't give each other a hug, maybe we can give ourselves a hug. And so these are skills that I'll actually work with with patients um, and ask them, you know, would you like to learn ways to, when you're feeling emotional, when you're feeling upset, just ways to sort of soothe yourself. And um, my understanding is these come from uh, these soothing gestures are actually arise from when we we're infants and when we'd be held and comforted to release oxytocin. And so one is just, you know, to even you can cup your cheeks just to provide some, um, some comfort. The one that I like is just giving myself a bit of a hug and, uh, and rubbing my arms in comfort. So maybe Brent, that's a solution is that if, you know, we sort of all do that, then we're giving ourselves and everybody else out there a hug. Um, and the other one is just putting your hands over your heart, um, and that can be really comforting as well. And uh, so there may be one gesture that you find to be more soothing. Um, the other thing is just working on um, doing some breathing exercises can be really grounding. They say that when, you know, when there's a big storm, trees take deeper roots. And so this is a time for us to maybe just try and stay grounded as well uh, with some uh, deep breathing exercises. And there is an app, I'm not sure if we um, can pull it up. So it's called Stop, Breathe, Think. And this is something that I encourage uh, patients who have access to apps to use. Um, it is a free app. And what I really like about it is you first do a check-in. So what, you know, how am I feeling right here, right now? So how am I feeling physically? How am I feeling mentally? And then I think the really important piece is how am I feeling emotionally? So it gives you a chance to uh, check what sort of um, emotional expression you feel with actually um, with either a happy face, sad face. And, and then it gives you a list of emotions. And I think this is something as a society that maybe we haven't been as good at. As, um, I understand as physicians, we tend to try and squash our emotions and, and, uh, and not to sort of um, tap in and deal with our emotions. However, we can't really tame what we can't name. So it really helps to identify what is the emotion I'm feeling. And then what I like about this app is it then gives you, based on how you're feeling in the moment, it gives you an appropriate meditation. Um, it usually gives you a choice of two. One might be three minutes, one might be five minutes to use. And so that's an exercise that I can encourage um, patients to use to help when they are feeling emotional distress. Because otherwise I think what happens is a lot of people uh, naturally use distraction. So they're binge watching, they're maybe drinking more, they're turning to substances, and, um, and it's not really allowing for those emotions to um, to be processed. And it's only, you know, if you think of all the sympathetic drive that people are experiencing right now, we need to try and balance that with some parasympathetic drive. And so teaching um, patients some tools to use would be really helpful. And I think these are tools that we can, we can use ourselves. Um, so I think, uh, I think that was really what I wanted to share that hopefully can help our patients as well as ourselves. And, uh, and I think Javid is maybe the next one who's going to uh, assist us. Hopefully with me, I'd like to learn more about the virtual aspect to provide care. Thank you, Leah. Um, wow, so, you know, I think your comments have sparked uh, lots of um, chatter on the chat box. Um, you know, I just, you know, in response to the virtual hugs, there, there were some really great comments out there. Um, Martin Withers said that, you know, a surrogate hug might help large stuffed animal or pillow aggressively hugged with eyes closed with picture of the individual present if possible. A few words spoken and even a picture or selfie taken and shared. Not the real thing, but better than nothing. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, people really uh, resonated, it resonated what you said and uh, our colleague Melissa Witte said, you know, yoga poses in, in the, it, it's based on yoga poses and the hugging of yourself. Um, um, I think, you know, you, you shared some resources for providers as well. And uh, I think Alan Grill, I'm trying to find it here, has uh, shared some short-term one-to-one um, therapy for healthcare workers at COVID19therapists.com. And uh, he's also shared a slide around, a, a link for CAMH uh, healthcare workers. 
um, and some uh, CBT um, that can be at info.mindbeacon.com. So all these great links that we will um, curate and put on our website. Um, Brian, I wonder if at this time you're able to just share a couple of slides uh, for our audience. So one of the slides maybe you can put up is mental health supports for providers. Um, if you go to that, I think it's slide 21. Uh, so you'll just have to go through, yeah, perfect. Um, and so uh, I think um, these are a couple that I think uh, Javed had um, recommended. Javed, did you wanna to speak to these two? Sure, great. Um, so one of the first things, there's lots of programs actually. So we have the Coping with COVID Echo for health providers of all disciplines. And it actually is really great because it's not just physicians and maybe isolated communities, but everybody else there together you work with. So it's a chance to both just surface what we're doing here to some extent right now, but also how do we cope with uh, being effective and actually dealing with issues that we're dealing with. So we actually become uh, more empowered. And so you can actually um, sign up. It's a free session. You get your credits for it as well, but it actually um, gives you a chance to get grounded, um, learn new things, talk together about how you solve them, actually get re-energized again. It's structured very much for that. So it runs twice a week. You drop in when you can, but just sign up in advance. Um, and we actually share the resources for everybody out there. So the resource link there is available for all the stuff to support various aspects of COVID care in your community. And the self-referral um, resources who can make for actually more intensive therapy is also available. And that's the link there. Um, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask, turn it over actually to Jennifer, because Jennifer, you have uh, another support for providers that you wanted to share. Jennifer? There's been an, um, uh, an initiative with the Ontario Psychological Association that uh, uh, in concert with the uh, OCFP, AFTO, and the NPAO, um, where the Ontario Psychological Association psychologists are offering pro bono uh, counseling up to six sessions for frontline workers who have been affected by COVID. And that's not just healthcare workers, it can be grocery store clerks, etc people who have um, have been affected in a negative way by by COVID. So uh, that the resource is, uh, I will put it up in the uh, up in the chat. And it is, uh, it is a referral for family physicians that uh, to for those for frontline workers up to six sessions, uh, free for people without funding for counseling. Um, thanks. Um, Brian, are you able to move to the Mindfulness for Patients app? Um, a slide, sorry. And, and so here are some of the ones that I think these are largely coming from Leah and I think a couple from Javed as well, some, some resources that can, we can um, use for patients. I think there's the link to the Stop, Breathe um, uh, app that uh, Leah mentioned. And I'll send these out on this chat as well. Um, uh, David Kaplan um, made a great point on the chat as well that you know physical health is important for mental health and uh, we often I think you know we think about CBT sometimes we forget about the behavior part that links to the to the um, to the, the uh, cognitive part and I, I think he suggested you know doing some online exercises and he recommended actually one of my new favorite apps the Peloton app I will say it's helped me with my own mental health when I haven't been able to get out, and um, uh, especially during a time when I was in self-isolation. Um, so anybody want to speak to any of these apps, uh, the, these resources on the slide before we turn to Java? I, I'd just like to, there was a question I saw in the chat about um, children and adolescents, and I used to give the helpline only to kids I was seriously worried about, but I am increasingly finding that I'm offering it to parents as an option who are barely making it themselves. And so trying to help their kids through grief or through the change or through anxiety that the world is ending. I, I'm saying if your kid really needs someone to talk to and you feel like you can't be there right now, this is another option. So um, I, I know that's not technically what they're there for, but I think that's, that may save lives in the long run because um, some families just don't have the resources to be able to answer those hard questions. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I think, uh, Brian, I wonder if we could go to the slide uh, where we have general links and crisis support for patients. Um, that one is just a couple before. Thank you so much. Um, so here we have highlighted, for example, Kids Help Phone, um, which uh, I think is a, is a great potential, uh, which I think everybody knows about, and they've seen huge volumes, but we've also listed some others here. Um, I, a panel, uh, somebody on the chat did ask whether we could have a PDF listing of all the excellent resources. Um, so we certainly can curate that. Um, we'll put them on our website, but there are a lot of amazing ones. Um, and so we'll, we'll try and create a PDF that we can circulate together when we, um, when we follow up with, uh, with everyone. Um, a few other resources that have come in. Um, uh, actually, a question for you, Claudette. What are the conditions you are working under? Are you gloved, masked up north? Um, and before we get to that, I'll just say that uh, Lee has posted. Lee Donahue has posted a good resource about from Echo um, Children and Youth Mental Health, and uh, Lee also posted a resource from OMA Supports for um, for when for for physicians who are looking for help for themselves. Claudette, um, I wonder if you could answer that question. What are the conditions you were working under? Um, challenging, challenging because we're trying to do social distancing even in the rooms and many of the rooms in the clinic are quite small. Um, but yes, masks and face shields. One of my colleagues have, has a friend with a 3D printer and those have become some of our closest friends. <laughs> but, um, and wearing a face shield and then certainly for a, if an exam is required, then gowns, but not every encounter is a gown. Right now we have enough PPE, but um, we've only had one proven case in the community and we're able to contain it. Um, so there's a, but we are trying very hard to work with our colleagues and my friend who's up, the physician who's up there right now was telling us the other day that the nurses wear the masks around their chin more than over their face and how difficult it is when you're trying to show the community how important this is and and then as healthcare professionals people watch every move we make right so it's yeah. it's been challenging yeah. um somebody did ask um you know, what are wait times like on, the, on these helplines or hotlines? It'd be a shame for a patient to call and have an inappropriate wait time. Uh, and of course that's true. Um, I, I'll say for my own patients, I use Gerstein a lot and I, have, I, I think patients have been able to get through. I haven't heard otherwise from my own patients, but I'd be, I don't know if any of the other panelists have um, any insight into the wait times. We tried the Hope for Wellness one just to ask them some questions and there wasn't a long wait line. It could have been the time of day. And in hindsight, that would have been a good question to ask. Like, do you have peak times where there is, what's the longest wait time that someone would have? Leah, you wanted to um, chime in. Um, sorry, no, actually, I was just went. no, I, I'm fine right now. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think um, what I'll do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Javed right now um, so that he can share a little bit um, about, you know, his reflections. I know, Javed, you know, you, you've thought a lot about mental health and kind of how we uh, think about mental health and conceptualize it. And I, I think when we spoke prior to today, I was interested to also that, you know, you had a very positive take on some of the opportunities actually that um, COVID has presented for us to even do things better. Um, and you've, as Leah mentioned, uh, you know, really integrated video visits and, and, uh, and conference calling into your practice. So I uh, would love to hear more about um, your reflections and what you uh, have done in your practice. Great, thank you. And actually I'll begin with a great comment that Brent Elsie made actually earlier in the thread, which really, um, encompass a lot of this. So he mentioned was when we're feeling lost in the woods, his grandchildren, the first thing they do is, is find a tree to hug. Um, and I think that actually was very much about situating yourself individually, but also seeing what's around you and what's available. And the learning process in that is that you're not as alone as you think. There are resources available to you right now, especially when you're feeling so lost and so much uncertainty in our world right now. 
Um, and I think that's actually what informed the way that um, I was looking at COVID right now. And I appreciate this whole framing that we begin with looking at ourselves as providers and how we're interacting and where we get agency and ability to keep on doing what we need to do. Um, and yeah, I think but I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just um, some people are having a hard time hearing you. Are you able to speak up or move sure. closer to your computer? Yeah, I'll try boosting up the gain on the microphone if I can. How's that? Is that any better? I think you're just a bit distant, so. How's that? Any better there? Hopefully, yes. Okay, sounds good. So what I was noticing actually was that um, we actually need to consider ourselves in this own process. That conversation that Claudette and Leo all talked about is how are we able to actually function right now and be most effective right now and not get caught up in our own blind spots and how we're being effective and looking for what we can do differently. Um, and so I'll kind of come to the next slide here right now. Um, Perfect. And what we recognize right now, we always recognize that both mental and physical needs were part of what we actually to support our patients with. But right now it's changing a lot. And so the next slide will show you where we're at. And so, so much more of physical health now is encompassed by mental health, um, by our anxieties, our worries reflect so much more. So the next slide is how I actually started understanding the patients who came to me. So my practice, I'm a family health group with a very complex population of patients with physical and mental health concerns. Chronic disease is a very big part of my practice. Um, and I realized very quickly that not just their ability to actually deal with mental health concerns ongoing was an issue, but how it actually impacted their chronic and acute uh, physical health care. And so knowing I was stretched thin already, a lot of virtual visits, a lot of um, time more than I had available before was coming in very quickly, despite my attempt to defer care. Um, and so I should recognize what was worth attending to and what was actually worth triaging to understand my population of patients to bring the resources to bear that I could and the time that I could to get the best value out of it because there wasn't a lot of time. And this is a way for me to also feel less out of control with a lot of unknowns and to begin to focus on what I could do to make things better, to scope down, to address. Um, and so we all know there's a lot of symptoms of mood and anxiety um, and that's, that's important for all our patients but may not be as distressing in the moment, but how do you evaluate it? And so one of the tools I recognized was using measurement-based care so the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. So they're emailed to patients and they respond back with it. Um, and so they actually can see, is it actually intense or is it not? Is it worrisome now or is it actually manageable right now? And I can actually plan the care and time accordingly. Um, and we're looking at actually not just symptoms now, but true disorders from mental health. Um, are there's new onset, obviously, both anxiety and mood. A lot of substance use we're recognizing is gonna be an issue very soon for our patients. And there's actually screening tools that make it much easier so they can actually fill it out in their own words and you reflect back. And this is validated better than our usual asking questions here and there, um, much more accurate. And so it also puts more power into patients' hands. It's about them telling their story and you're responding to the story but rather than trying to dig into them to make them tell you what you want to know. So you're hearing first and you're reflecting back and you're focusing your care accordingly. Uh, for pre-existing disorders, so aside from the usual ones I mentioned there, personality really comes in. So a lot of patients are decompensating in this context. Other ones are actually doing better, and this is the challenge. So I've had patients who had um, a long history of trauma in their childhood, but actually are safer in their adulthood, who are struggling with anxiety and other challenges for the last couple of years, who a lot of them, is actually very surprising to me, commented that they felt calmer and more stable than they expected to feel when it first started hitting um, um, our communities in March. And they're actually having their family members comment on this to them as well. And so through reflection, they start to talk about what actually might be helping them. So it's worth understanding that their struggles in childhood, living under dangerous conditions for so long, actually, this is in some ways more familiar for them, a big threat that they couldn't control. And they had learned to function by focusing on what they could within their sphere of influence and surviving. And they are resorting back to that mechanism right now to cope and actually doing very well because of it. Out of that, even though it's an immediate benefit, there will be long-term uh, concerns to watch for as well because they might revert to old ways of coping that are not so adaptive going forward. And so sensitizing them from now and actually being ready for that conversation letter, structuring meetings in advance with them rather than waiting for crisis to emerge and only reacting was a good way of keeping things stable in the long run. Um, and definitely we already know that the uh, implication on physical health for our patients became very unstable as well. So people who are less active, stress eating, not taking the medications because they're distracted as well, start decompensating a lot of chronic conditions as well. And as I said, some people, because they have now more time, are actually being more active. So evaluating and then deciding who in my practice do I need to worry about, who do I not need to worry about, and really quickly beginning to plan your time over the next month to monitor who needs it most um, by screening everybody early on. 
and the implications on acute care is a new onset. So in my practice alone, which is a small, pretty intense practice, we had three, we we're having three concurrent workups for cancer that started within the last two weeks and pretty serious and concerning ones. Some people willing to get tested despite their COVID concerns. Some were resisting coming in. I had a patient yesterday who actually um, has very, very severe anemia to the point where she actually needed transfusions early this year, who was supposed to go for a follow-up who actually didn't go because she was so worried about COVID and actually could barely walk around her house because she's so tired. Um, and we just had a plan to support her to get the care we wanted, getting cancer care diagnosis and managing it with this distance happening everywhere right now. So recognizing explicitly upfront, raising the concerns with patients made it much easier to have those conversations rather than waiting for them to say things that they may be uncomfortable or shy or not want to talk about. So normalizing it really early on helps. Um, and I know for me, I'll, I'll close here, the, the, the biggest anxieties I had personally were at the end of February, actually before everybody else got worried about COVID when I felt it coming, I need to advocate. And I felt a bit calmer over the last month when actually more people were doing everything right. And again, now as we get close to reopening, the anxiety increases again, will we do it safely enough? What's the new step? Because we actually haven't got all the pieces in place yet to make it um, safe going forward. And we haven't got society on board yet fully for how to reopen safely in a measured, slow way, though our politicians are obviously trying as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities. I found virtual care helped connect patients who actually um, were, so I use video a lot more. There's a lot of effort getting my, my seniors involved, um, but actually the ones who are hearing impaired could actually type in the chat or who could actually lip read me talking. And that was easier than trying telephone care. A patient who actually had her voice box removed for cancer um, about two months ago, um, who actually could type in the chat, who actually couldn't necessarily have talked on the phone either. Um, so opportunities to connect with pharmacists, with other virtual care. So now this virtual code allows physicians who couldn't be part of case conferences because of the funding models to actually engage in them and participate with their patients and the other providers to coordinate care better. So a lot of new chances as well. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, uh, Javed. Um, uh, I think I'm going to ask Brian to just go to the next slide um, because I think this is where you're sharing a, some, there were some questions on the chat about the measurement tools that you recommended. And I think this is a slide that um, summarizes some of them. Um, David Kaplan did mention on the chat that, you know, he uses Ocean uh, to send um, questionnaires and then they are integrated into the EMR. I do actually the same and I find I can even do that while the patient is on the call with me. Um, and it's a great way uh, to check in and do the tool. Um, anything you wanted to mention specifically about these tools, Shadow? So recognizing even if you don't have a fully integrated system right now, we, we should take advantage of the loosening of privacy laws because there's no point in actually making sure we met the expectation of the privacy commissioner do what's safest and best for the patient right now. Privacy being a consideration that comes secondary to providing value first. Um, and so I have patients who actually, it's easier with asynchronous emails. You email them the night before when I book their appointment, fill this out before your appointment, send it the night before, we review it at your appointment. So it's actually much more standardized. It's easier to keep up with the volume it's not taking up time when I'm already on the phone with them. And it's worth mentioning two kinds of tools here. So we have a lot of screening tools, uh, but we have a couple that are considered measurement-based care. And that's, for example, the PHQ-9, the GD7 for anxiety, PCL for trauma, and the Young Mania Rating Scale, which actually can be used to titrate your care as you go along. So you can know, am I making progress and should I change my treatment based on that first line? The other tools are good for screening, but not necessarily good for actually knowing if your treatment is effective. So this is a good with guiding practice with the measurement-based care tool. Audit C is the second link, which is really important for substance use. It's patient filled out. On that site, there's also resources for patients to self-reflect and understand, and they can come to you. So you can, you can offer a resource, and then they'll come to you when they're ready to see how they're doing with it. Thank you, Javed. Um, so I'm going to also go now to some questions that have been posted. Um, Leah, I think you were going to answer Risa Boardman's question. So Risa had asked about she has several patients in her practice whose manifestation of anxiety is somatization, and every call is a new physical complaint. Um, they won't reach out for virtual help as it's not a physician examining them. Um, she's seen them at least once in the office, but you know it's, it's been really hard, and as soon as we resolve one physical complaint, another appears. What suggestions do you have, Lisa, Leah? Yeah, so th this is such a, a tricky question. Um, and it's really hard to try and influence patients to explore the possibility that maybe it's, you know, sort of the emotional distress that's presenting physically. Um, so trying to sort of introduce the idea. Um, certainly, I think I often start by saying, you know, it sounds like 
these symptoms are causing you a lot of distress and sometimes that distress can make things worse you know would you be interested in maybe i use very soft language maybe you know trying to do um some some exercises or some breathing exercises just to see if we can kind of lessen the distress that you're feeling and um and so this would be doing some breath work and also Again, just some meditation. So there are there are meditations that you can find. Um, like so, if someone's having like more irritable bowel symptoms, um, you can search for that. And there might be a meditation where they're sort of like focusing on the symptoms that they're having, but then they notice sort of before and after the after the meditation, those symptoms have lessened. And then it's about again sort of just cueing them to notice the before and after. So you know, how are you feeling before the meditation? And, uh, and then afterwards, what was the difference? And this is also an opportunity to introduce, if they're okay with this, um, to try a body scan. Because what happens is our, our brains can really start to focus in on one part of our body. And so with a body scan, we're just trying to tap into like our entire body so that we're aware of um, symptoms that might be uh, that we could notice elsewhere so that we're not sort of focusing on one part. And so it's, it's a bit of education. I think the um, e-mental health, so if any of you are not familiar with that website, that's out of, um, out of Ottawa, and they have um, a primary care provider um, sort of database. So whatever the issue is, and they do have support for somatization. So you can go to e-mental health primary care, uh, click on somatization disorders and it will just walk you through like what questions to ask, how to approach it, how to have the conversation. And I think that's a really good um, resource that you could maybe use as well. Thank you. Um, you know, we've been sharing a lot of uh, resources and maybe Brian, are you able to pull up the um, slide resource hubs for practitioners? Um, So here are a few areas where you can go where there are a bunch of resources already collated. And uh, again, we'll send out these links. Um, one that Leah, you had mentioned was Connects Ontario. And um, if you're able to go to the next slide, um, uh, Brian, thank you. This was actually, I thought pretty neat. You shared with me your text chat with Connects Ontario. And I wonder if you could just speak to your um, experience using Connects Ontario, because I certainly myself hadn't used it in this way, and it seemed like it was a five minute, eight minute interaction, and it resolved your issue. Yes, and I, I think it was actually shorter than eight minutes, because while I was waiting for um, the agent to get back to me, I was sort of doing some other stuff, so it sort of delayed our conversation a bit. Um, so Connects Ontario, you can either, you know, you can try and speak to them over the phone, or do a web search. But what I really like is the chat option. So um, someone had, we were given a few sort of questions that you were already asking in advance of this. And one was what sort of counseling services are available in Ontario that would be free. And so, um, so that's really what I asked. So I just put here, I'm a family physician looking for some counseling and what virtual options are covered by OHEP. And then they, they did need to know the age and the gender and sort of what you know the main issue was so I just made that up and then um, and then they came back with a few resources that I wasn't really aware of so the first one is bounce back which I think many of you probably are familiar with um, which is sort of a Brian like, can you go to the next slide actually uh, and the next one after that yeah okay great thanks um, so um, so the so the resources that they suggested um, so bounce back which is where you get some the patient will get some telephone coaching plus receive um, workbooks in the mail and then they they have a coach that sort of touches base with them weekly to build some cognitive therapy skills um, the two new ones were mind beacon and um, ability CBT and so these are two programs that I th I know mind beacon used to be sort of privately covered. But now I think the government is funding this for people in Ontario. So it's a really good resource for our patients and they can self-refer. Um, Big White Wall is, I think I sort of understand that it's like, um, kind of like more like a Facebook page where there's opportunities to chat, but it is supported with mental health professionals to guide the conversations. And that also is free in the province of Ontario. 
and I'm not familiar with Wellness Together, so that's a new one for me. I, yeah, I added Wellness Together. That's a brand new resource from the federal government. My, um, they have a lot of resources for patients on mental health and, and addictions, but um, apparently if you, you, you navigate it well enough, you can actually get to some free CBT support as well. Um, and so I, uh, our social worker shared that one with our team. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you actually, and Brian, can you go to the second last slide, the mentoring for mental health and addiction and pain? Um, and Jennifer, do you, because you know, this is a lot about us supporting each other, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the OCFP network. Sure. The, um, the OCFP has had uh, 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 the mentoring networks were in place for many years, and um, we have been delighted to hear that there's been some refunding of them. And we are in the process of, of relaunching the, the program that will have both long-term and shorter-term mentoring with, um, with our uh, uh, expert colleagues. Uh, there are, uh, there's, uh, and I, if I could, if I could, uh, if I could uh, take the liberty Leah, of saying you've been a real integral part of the mental health uh, mentoring network over the years, and um, and so mental health addictions and pain are are uh, opportunities for family physicians to connect with other family physicians and experts in the area of these in these three areas to establish a mentoring relationship so both longer term but also short term uh, coaching defined defined focus are the two aspects of this program that we have now it's been confirmed that that funding will continue for uh, for the OCFP that's great news um, we have, um, I think, one last question that I'm going to try and ask Javed if he could address briefly because it is an important one um, before we wrap up. And that was a question that Brent Elsie um, uh, asked, which was, many of our patients, seniors, marginalized, have limited or no ability to use apps or websites. What do panelists recommend for these groups? And I have to say, I've been struggling with some of my patients around that. And uh, Often my approach is to check in with them weekly and, and see if I can get uh, someone live to, to do so perhaps even more frequently. Um, I've been thinking about, should I be mailing them resources? Um, but Javed, what, what, what are your thoughts? Sure. And through recognizing there's some patients you actually can't help with technology directly and that's fair enough. There'll be a smaller portion than you think though. So working with uh, Lisa Sokolov, um, who actually does the care of the elderly at Konala programs, there's a lot of evidence that seniors are significantly higher user technology than we actually expect them to be. So our own biases are a significant barrier. A lot of them are connecting with other community groups already within their, their religious and other groups with uh, Zoom and other technologies already. They're getting help from that network to get themselves digitalized over the last while. So I think asking, asking if there's help that they think they need to, asking what they need to get support and seeing these ways of connecting them. So um, social workers can work with them to actually see if it's, it's simply coaching with a technology startup because you don't have the time as a provider, as a physician to do it, but maybe their social worker can talk to them on the phone and guide them through the steps to do to get going. Uh, many actually do have cell phones. Now there's gonna be patients who socioeconomically don't have access and that's a different barrier, but age shouldn't be the, the assumption um, for why people can't use things. Um, my practice is very old, like it's a, it's a really older practice for the most part. And actually it's shocking me how many of them are comfortable and really happy to actually use video and connect after this and be supported that way. So I think differentiating who really can't be helped, getting them support for the transition, because this is gonna be an 18 month process and we can't leave them hanging without adapting to the new reality. Like government is even banking on senior care through technology going forward. Thank you. Yeah. It's Claudette, could I just- Yeah, Claudette, please go ahead. I Maybe because I work in an area, and well, I think we all do really, where people die from mental health reasons. So I believe those people who can't get the care other ways, those are people to me that it's worth gowning up and putting my mask on and seeing. And I think that sometimes we have to acknowledge that that's a, a life-saving measure. And I want us all to be really careful, but I... I firmly believe there will be people we need to see and assess in person because they lack the technology, the ability. I think of my mother-in-law who's 84 with severe glaucoma and it took her forever to learn to say, hey, Google, play Charlie Pride. You know, she's not gonna be ac accessing mental health resources over the, the yeah. computer anytime soon. So thanks, sorry, 
just Claudette, just... I think that's a really important note to end on. I mean, so um, I, I will also say, uh, you know, with the, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, our own practice has been trying to collect uh, phone, cell phone donations and tablet donations, and has also sourced some resources um, where people can get free inter uh, free or low cost internet. Um, so we can certainly try and share those as well. But Claudette, you make a fantastic point that, you know, seeing someone who is in a mental health crisis, um, someone who, where we are uh, suspecting domestic violence, those are reasons where we um, need to bring people in um, and, uh, and protect ourselves and them appropriately. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. Um, and thank you to everybody who shared uh, today, our panelists, um, but also all of you in the audience. We've had so many amazing resources flying back and forth on that chat, and it's going to be our job to pull them together for you. We do commit to putting them up on our website along with the recorded version of this, of this um, webinar. Um, in addition, um, we will take up uh, uh, your suggestion and put them into a Word or PDF document that you guys can circulate to your colleagues. Um, uh, uh, we put, put up to the websites where OCFP has a ton of resources and we put up our U of T DFCM COVID community of practice website. The, um, the main pro credits will be uh, mailed to, emailed to you um, within two weeks of the session. No, it does not automatically, unfortunately, go to your main pro. You do have to manually put it in. Um, but thank you to everyone today again for coming in. This has been, I think, a, a, one of our most powerful um, community of practices to date. Join us in two weeks for our next, next session um, and stay tuned for those details. And in the meantime, um, stay safe.